What's up everybody and welcome to Heresy Financial. My name is Joe Brown and today we are going to be discussing Bitcoin and I'm going to be presenting you with the skeptics case for Bitcoin. As I've recently been doing more and more research into Bitcoin, I've been learning things about it that are completely contrary to what I actually thought was the case. We've all heard the financial experts, even billionaires like Ray Dalio, spout out the often repeated phrases, things like, blockchain is the real innovation here, not necessarily a cryptocurrency. Or, nobody knows which cryptocurrency will be the one that ends up lasting if any of them do. Or, Bitcoin's volatility means that it is not a good store of value. And finally, if something like Bitcoin does really take off, don't you think that the government is going to step in and control it? We're gonna bust all of these myths and we're gonna take a deep dive into the history of money, what money really is, what it means for something to operate as money and present a skeptic's case that is bullish for Bitcoin. This video represents a beginner's introduction into Bitcoin. And so if you've been part of the Bitcoin community for a while here, you might not learn anything new in this video, but we're going to make a conservative case for Bitcoin for the skeptics and bust some of the myths about Bitcoin that are kind of pervasive out there in the mainstream media with regular financial experts. Let's dive in. Okay, so a couple things that I need to note here for you guys before we jump in. The first thing is that this video is for educational purposes only. It's not uh, advice or recommendation specifically to buy Bitcoin. And that's particularly important with something like Bitcoin because personally, the reason why I've stayed away from Bitcoin for so long is because I didn't understand it, which as a general rule of thumb for investing, or how to allocate your money, that is a good rule of thumb to follow is that if you don't understand something, stay away from it. During the financial crisis, we had billions of dollars in collateralized mortgage securities and nobody understood how they worked, what was in them, what gave them value, or what would cause them to go up or down. It was a giant black hole that nobody understood, yet everybody was pouring billions and billions of dollars into these extremely complex securities. We know how that turned out when they all blew up in everybody's face. As a general rule of thumb, it makes sense to stay away from something if you don't understand it. And then once you've learned about it and have educated yourself about it, then you'll be able to make an educated decision about whether it's right for you or not. And so this video is designed to teach you about what money is, how money works, we'll examine Bitcoin by the historical standards for money, and I'll give you the tools that you need to start to make an educated decision about Bitcoin for yourself. Okay, and the second thing that I need to tell you about this video is that most of the information presented here, I've gathered from the book, The Bitcoin Standard. Obviously with my own interpretation and flavor and layers on top of it, but that being said, if you want a deep dive into what we're discussing today, I highly recommend that book. It's a fantastic book, even just from the perspective of a beginner's guide into Austrian economics. If you want to understand the reality of how money actually works, that is a great place to start. It's highly distilled. It's very easily and simply explained and very thorough in its research and analysis. And I will link that book in the description below if you'd like to uh, take a look at that book yourself. All right. So what is money? There are two things that are absolutely necessary for something to work well as money. Those two things are that it has to operate well as a store of value and it has to operate well as a medium of exchange. Now, those two things are necessary for something to work well as money, but they're not sufficient in and of themselves. What that means is that just because something is a good store of value, that doesn't necessarily mean it'll work well as money. The Mona Lisa, for instance, is a good store of value, but it's never gonna work as a universal form of money. Similarly, something like dirt or rocks would work well as a medium of exchange, but uh, it's so abundant that, that there's no real intrinsic value in just a pile of pebbles. And so something like that won't work as money while it satisfies the requirements for uh, operating well or being able to operate well as medium of exchange. These two things are necessary, but not sufficient. Okay, so let's break down store of value and medium of exchange. 
For something to work well as a store of value, it needs to have two factors. It needs to have intrinsic desirability, and it also needs to have a finite supply. Because if you have something that, be, that can be created at will, or something that is basically so abundant that there is no lack of supply or inability to access it without some sort of labor or hard work, then you don't have something with a good store of value. So those are the two things you need for something to work well as a store of value. It needs to have intrinsic desirability, something that gives it value by itself, something that makes people want it just in and of itself. And then it also needs to have a finite supply. It can't be just universally, infinitely accessible. So the second thing that we said it needs to have as far as what makes it work well as money is it has to operate well as a medium of exchange. Uh, what that means is that uh, barter doesn't work. Uh, it's it's never worked it people do a little bit of barter do you have some historical examples of barter happening whenever there's an emergency or a natural disaster little times here and there but overall barter has never existed as a form of how money or even small local economies work because you can't exchange something like a million pairs of shoes for a house you're never going to be able to barter your way in any sort of a complex society and so you need a medium of exchange in order to uh, kind of be the uh, the middleman between goods and services so if you want something to operate well as a medium of exchange number one it has to have an ease of accessibility and uh, that means that it has to be uh, easily divisible so something like rice has operated as money in the past in certain societies because it's pretty easily divisible. You can just weigh out a certain amount. You can count the small grains of rice. You can uh, weigh large bags of rice. It's uh, easily accessible. Most people would have access to it. The second thing that you need to have for something to operate well as a medium of exchange is universal acceptance. Uh, people just have to generally accept uh, that uh, item, that commodity in general. They just have to be willing to accept it. It has to be universally acknowledged as the medium of exchange. And lastly, there has to be a level of security or indestructibility associated with that uh, form of money because if it is easily destroyed or if it's easily copied, it doesn't work well as a medium of exchange because if it's easily counterfeited, then I can pay you and somebody else without actually producing anything that creates that wealth. So throughout history, if you look back in time, you can see there are a number of things that have operated as money. The first of which was actually credit. We have anthropological evidence from 5,000 years ago that shows that the earliest and pretty much the most consistent form of money uh, was credit, was debt, was favors. And these would be recorded on things like tally sticks where they would uh, notch uh, marks on sticks and then uh, those would represent credits or favors or debts that people owed each other. But then those debts and favors and credits were actually traded between each other as money. I've already mentioned rice. It has operated as money before. Salt has as well. Now we all know that for the last 3,000 years, uninterrupted except for the last 50 years, gold operated as money. And finally, over the last 50 years, we've had paper operating as money. Now each of these items historically has met most of the requirements that you need to uh, operate well as money, but not all, because you don't need to meet all of the requirements for something to actually operate as money in a society, but the more of the requirements you hit, the better that money will serve the society. Now, gold has operated as the best form of money throughout history and throughout cultures, throughout societies, countries, and time. And the reason for that is because it has met most of the requirements that you need for something to operate well as money. It's also pretty self-evident that paper has operated the worst as money. And we can go back hundreds of years and see that every time paper is used as money that's not backed by anything else with intrinsic value, it leads to destroyed economies and a destruction of wealth overall. And every time we've had a good source of money, something like gold, we've seen the most prosperous, the best growth, and the most wealthy times and countries in the entire world throughout history. When you have a society operating with good money, it benefits savers, it punishes spending, and it punishes borrowing. It creates a society and people with a high time preference for money. It rewards 
future thinking, future behavior, and not acting on current impulses, but on building something sustainable and foregoing immediate pleasure for long lasting success. It causes capital to accumulate in a society instead of deteriorate. Now I've talked a lot in past videos about how that does that individually, but as a society, the number one reason why a good source of money that meets most of the requirements noted before about what makes up good money causes a society to be prosperous and to have a lot of growth is because of the incentive it provides for investments. Okay, now this part is a little bit tricky, so I'm gonna explain it in detail here, and please let me know in the comments if you have any further questions about it. In general, when you have a society that uses sound money or uh, stable money or good money, you have the value of that money stay very, very stable over time, and its purchasing power of most things slowly increases over time. It's got a very slow slope up in terms of its purchasing power. And the main reason for that is because just due to technological innovations, population growth, efficiencies in utilizing resources better, things get cheaper. And so if the amount of money in the society stays the same, things get cheaper, which means the purchasing power of those units of money goes up slowly over time. This means that if you just hold on to your money in a society like this, your purchasing power increases over time. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is save and your money appreciates in value. So what does this do to investing? Well, that means that if you're going to make an investment, you need a very high probability that the return that you'll receive on that invested capital will be greater than the slow appreciation just from saving your money. So there's an extremely high bar to be met with investing your money that not only does it have to keep pace with just the gradual increase in purchasing power of your money, but it has to do better than that. And the longer it takes for you to get that return, the more return it has to provide. Further than that, the return will be real because it will be based on real purchasing power because the money itself represents real purchasing power. Okay, now on the flip side, in a society that has a uh, fiat money that is not backed by anything that increases its supply over time, something like a paper money society we have right now, the supply of the money increases over time, which means the purchasing power of that money decreases over time. So you get a slope like this, where the purchasing power of that money slowly dies over time. We've seen 86% of the purchasing power of the dollar dissolved since we left the gold standard in 1971. So what does that do to investing? Well, if you're going to deploy your money in an investment, the only requirement is that it does better than your money just sitting there. Well, when you lose 86% of your money's value from sitting there over 50 years, the bar for an investment producing something is pretty low. In fact, that bar is negative. The only requirement for you to invest your money is that it returns a value to you that is less bad than the money is treating you just by sitting there. So if, you're, if your money loses 5% of its value every year, you would invest your money in something that would return a negative 4% return every year. A bad money society incentivizes investments in wealth destroying investments. The bar is so low that negative returning investments are not only acceptable, but they're common and they're better than just keeping your money in cash. And that is why every period of time in every country that you look out throughout history that has their society based on sound money, and usually that's been gold, you've seen way more growth and prosperity than any country or any time that is founded on unsound or fiat money. Okay, okay, I get it already. Sound money is better. What does this have to do with Bitcoin? Enter Satoshi Nakamoto, the anonymous programmer who invented Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an open source peer-to-peer -peer payments software, payment program with its own digital currency. What that means is that Bitcoin payments are not in and of themselves backed or redeemed by anything other than than bitcoins. It's not backed by gold or dollars or anything else. So here are a couple key factors about Bitcoin that we'll dive into more in detail. Number one, Bitcoin is open source. Number two, Bitcoin is finite. There's a finite supply of Bitcoins. Number three, the verification of Bitcoin transactions is decentralized, not centralized. Number four, Bitcoin was organically adopted and grew organically. It was never promoted or forced on any group of people by any government. And finally, number five, there is no single or central authority who has any control 
over the way that Bitcoin operates. Okay, so number one, open source. What does that mean? Well, it means that, that the creator of Bitcoin did not design this where he has the control over it and he didn't design it in a way where it is closed to changes. It's actually open source. Anybody can go in, they can take the software, they can use it for themselves, or they can propose changes to the existing Bitcoin network. What this meant was that very early on, all of the kinks in the system got worked out very quickly by the small number of users that started using it. That meant that the best version of Bitcoin was settled on very early on by a community of early adopters that organically started using it, not by any central authority or team. Whenever there was a new version that was presented, it had to be adopted by a majority of the Bitcoin users for it to take effect. Early on, that was pretty easy because there were not a lot of people using Bitcoin. But now that it's so large, it's virtually impossible that any suggestion to the change of how Bitcoin works would be adopted because it would always rep any sort of change would represent some sort of trade off between the holders and the miners. And we'll get into those in a minute. The other thing that having it be open source did was allowed other cryptocurrencies to be built that were similar to Bitcoin, but not exactly. Because ultimately, if you're going to create something that is exactly the same as Bitcoin, and I'm going to call it, let's say, Joe coin, why would anybody use Joe coin? Nobody else uses uses it, I might as well use Bitcoin if it's the exact same thing. So if I'm going to create a new cryptocurrency, it has to have some differentiating factor for me to say, hey, everybody should use JoeCoin instead of Bitcoin. Okay, next, it has a finite supply. There are only 21 million Bitcoins that will ever exist. They're not all created yet, but they are released over time. And they are released to the people and the computers that do the verification of transactions. Now, these people are called miners because as they do their work, they slowly accumulate Bitcoins but they're not really mining anything. They're just verifying the transactions that are taking place on the Bitcoin network. And their reward for doing that work is they are paid in new Bitcoins. Now, there is a very steady pace of the number and the speed at which Bitcoins are released into the system. And there is an exact date in the year 2140 that the final Bitcoin will be released and produced because every four years, the number of Bitcoins that are being released cuts in half. And in fact, next month in May, we have another halvening that is going to happen where the number of Bitcoins being produced is going to be cut in half. Now, the decentralization of these transactions being verified is at the same time Bitcoin's greatest strength and its greatest weakness. It's a weakness for Bitcoin because it's extremely inefficient. There are millions of computers that have to verify every single transaction that happens on the network. So if I pay you with a Bitcoin, every single miner out there is going to look at that transaction and verify that one Bitcoin left me and went to you. And then they all look at each other and they compare that ledger in their book entry and say, yep, we all have the same transaction taking place. And then it's recorded for all of time and for all of history. And every single person has a copy of this ledger. And so from an energy standpoint and the cost of electricity to verify all these transactions, it is extremely inefficient. And the time it takes to verify these transactions is extremely inefficient. Bitcoin can at max verify four transactions per second or something like Visa that has a centralized one or two or three sources that verify its transactions, they can verify millions of transactions per second. But because there are so many verifiers out there looking at every transaction and then making their own record of it, it is almost impossible to hack at this point because you would have to, at the same exact time, be able to alter the records of 51% of all of the verifiers that are out there. So first you'd have to be able to break the encryption and then you'd have to simultaneously have enough time, money, energy, and electricity to go out to every single verifier and change the records. Now, as the network grows, the bar, the requirements for how much energy and time and money that would take grows. But the best part is, is that the reward for doing so is zero because the moment somebody is able to hack the system and let's say give themselves a million Bitcoin, well, 49% of the network would realize what happened and it would render the usefulness and the value of Bitcoin zero because the attraction to Bitcoin is that it is virtually unhackable. And if somebody is able to 
cross that bar, then there is almost no use for Bitcoin anymore. And so the reward for stealing Bitcoin becomes zero. Okay, so another thing that is unique to Bitcoin is that no team or government or person controls it or ever promoted it. Like I said, it's open source. So at the beginning, anybody who is using it was able to propose changes and use that software to try and make their own coin. What this led to was a huge number of new coins being produced that differentiated themselves primarily from the standpoint of efficiency. But any change that you make to how the cryptocurrency works will either benefit the holders or it will benefit the verifiers or it will benefit the controlling team. And the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of these new coins that were produced were produced in order to make the creators wealthy. They created a team, they had a promotion, a PR campaign, and then they tried to get people to use it. None of the other coins have grown organically. Bitcoin is the only one that had this massive organic adoption where people just decided to start using it because they wanted to, not because there were any uh, marketing or PR campaigns saying that they'd get rich from it, at least at first. But further than that, because it requires 51% of the network to agree to a change, there is no team that controls it. So these are the features that are unique to Bitcoin that no other cryptocurrency and quite honestly, no other form of money in the past has able to meet quite as effectively as Bitcoin. Now, when we look back through history, we see a very repeatable and predictable pattern that anytime a society moves from a solid, a sound source of money to a bad source of money, the society, the economy eventually collapses, the usage of that money eventually collapses, and people adopt a new form of money that is much more sound, much more stable. So recognizing this, it's not so much a question of, of whether something will replace the dollar, but the real question is what will end up replacing the dollar. So it seems like at this point, there's a pretty strong case for a cryptocurrency, but what about all of the other ones out there besides Bitcoin? Well, like I said, the number one differentiating factor that some of these other coins have that Bitcoin doesn't is that there's some team or controlling party that makes changes to the software. Now, the second largest cryptocurrency right now is Ethereum. And a couple years ago, there was a hack on Ethereum where somebody was able to use the code to transfer a bunch of Ethereum to themselves. This was called the DOA hack. Now, this person didn't actually hack or steal these Ethereum coins because in reality, he was just operating under the rules that Ethereum had set up and he exploited a weakness that the team didn't know was actually there. But because they didn't like that he was able to do that, they went into the blockchain and they cut the blockchain off at right before that happened. And then they started a new blockchain from there, essentially erasing what he had done. And now there's really actually two different forms of Ethereum. The blockchain that has him able to have those uh, coins that he stole. And then the new one that they fixed where that didn't actually ever happen. Now you might look at that and say, hey, that's great that you're able to you know, undo transactions and prevent theft or, or hacking. But that's also the biggest problem with something like, like the dollar that is controlled by government. Because if Ethereum was able to get to the point where it was so big that everybody was using it, the government would be able to step in and control it. And so the fact that Bitcoin doesn't have a centralized authority or team controlling it means that there's no way 51% of the network would stand to benefit from changes to the way that Bitcoin operates or undoing something on the blockchain. And essentially, if you were to, going, to, going to try and propose a change to Bitcoin to make it better, it would only be better for the verifiers or it would be better for the holders. So the inefficiencies that are built into Bitcoin are what give it its strength and its invulnerability to attack. What this means is that the idea that blockchain in and of itself is the innovation that can be divorced from Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies is absolute nonsense because it's a tool that is designed for peer-to-peer -peer payments. It's a monetary technology. It doesn't have any application or use outside of being used for a cryptocurrency. And we know that because over the past decade, the blockchain technology has been available for use and there have been zero developments or zero widespread adoptions of using it in any way other than as a cryptocurrency. And further than that, there is no cryptocurrency that has taken off the way that Bitcoin has because Bitcoin was adopted organically, it grew organically, it was open source and any of the changes necessary to make it work better and to operate well as money were put into place so 
early on that now anything to make it better would disadvantage so many users on the network that changes are just not going to take place. So the idea that we don't know which cryptocurrency will catch on and take off is pretty much in my opinion utter nonsense. Because if a cryptocurrency is going to be the money of the future, it's going to be Bitcoin. So what's the catch? The catch is obviously widespread adoption and uh, intrinsic desirability. Now as fiat money becomes more and more destructive and more and more people wake up to the fact that a government controlling money and destroying our money for their own benefit becomes widely known, using a money that is by nature outside of the control of any controlling agency or government or company for that matter, becomes more and more attractive. Now, technically gold could absolutely resume its role as money, especially in today's day and age with technology, you could have gold operate with digital payments and settlement happen in actual physical delivery of gold. But if you're arguing for that, there's a little bit more of a case to be argued for Bitcoin taking that role because the speed and the ease of settlement and transactions is far easier with something on a network like Bitcoin rather than physical delivery of a physical commodity like gold. Now, again, gold does have a much longer history, 3000 year history of storing its value uh, whereas Bitcoin only has a 10 year history, pretty much, and uh, its price in terms of dollars has been extremely volatile. And the volatility is likely to persist for who knows how long. But aside from the innate desirability and the widespread adoption of using Bitcoin, it meets pretty much every other requirement for a good source of money without fail, which means that the more and more people understand it and educate themselves about it and start to use it, the better it will operate as a store of value and the less volatile it will be. In summary, Bitcoin's attributes, its organic growth and its nature, just its general default makeup, give it the characteristics that make it look like it could very well be the people's money of the future. And if Bitcoin is widely adopted as the standard of what money really is, I have no doubt that our world will enter into a time of massive growth, massive prosperity and wealth creation like we have never seen before. So that's my Bitcoin spiel. I really hope you learned something. And again, this is not a recommendation or advice to go out and buy Bitcoin. If you want to learn more, I highly recommend starting with the Bitcoin standard. I have it linked below. And please let me know if you have any questions or thoughts in the comments below. I really appreciate you guys listening. Have a great day.